Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 684, with my guest today, Hanshi Frank Dukes. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. What do we do? What are all of these things that we do? Well, go to whistlekick.com and find out. We've got a ton of stuff over there, including our store. And if you use the code podcast15, you can save 15% on anything we've got over there from sparring gear to apparel and so much more. The show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for that, where we bring you transcripts and links and photos and all kinds of cool stuff for every episode. We bring you two a week. Why? Well, it's to connect and educate and entertain all of you wonderful traditional martial artists out there. If you want to show some support, help us out in our mission, yeah, you could buy something, but there are other things you could do. You could join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick, where we post bonus and exclusive content each and every week. You could also, I don't know, maybe follow us on social media, or you could even share an episode with a friend. There are a lot of martial artists out there. Not all of them check out our show, and we would like to fix that. Hopefully, you'll help us in that goal. And if you want the full list, I almost missed this part. If you want the full list of all the things that you can do to give back, to support what we're doing, whistlekick.com slash family. That's where we drop that whole list. So today's episode, Hanshi Frank Dukes, a big name, a large figure in the martial arts community, and frankly, a bit of a lightning rod at times, someone who has attracted some attention, and it's not always positive. I knew that going in, right? Like this is someone I, I know of, had never met him before. Our first contact was when we hooked up the Zoom and I think it went really well. It was a really good conversation. Now it's, there's something I think that's really important to, to say here at the top. I don't go into any episode. And if you know the history on this show, you know that this is true. I don't go into any episode trying to stir the pot. I have no interest in making a guest look bad. I have no interest in making a guest look good. I have an interest in bringing a conversation between myself and whoever's on the other end to the rest of you. I have no doubt that we are going to attract some attention for this episode and not all of it will be positive. Frankly, I don't care. Because whether you like or dislike, believe, disbelieve, no matter what your opinions are on this or any other episode we've done, this is a part of our cultural landscape. We are martial artists, we train martial arts, we have martial arts movies, and we have figures who are discussed. This is someone I've wanted on the show for a long time. I'm very thankful to the team for making this happen. And I'm very thankful to Hanji Dukes for coming on and sharing some time with us. Here we go. Hanshi, how are you? Good. I'm just trying to see you here. Um, hey, can you see me? I can see you. All right. I can see you. Very awesome. good. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. So, and you're in the, from the Chicago area, right? I'm in Vermont. Vermont. Okay. Similarly I cold. I was actually talking to someone in Chicago yesterday, Monday. Yeah, yesterday. And similar weather. We've both been hammered with snow and cold. And yeah. How about you? Where are you? Right now I'm in Las Vegas. I relocated okay. to Las Vegas. I used to live in Los Angeles. I mean, I, I was all over from Hollywood yeah. to Hermosa B. Um, I've had, a, I was, I've been very blessed in the sense of uh, having some great locations where I lived at in Hollywood Hills. I lived right on Madonna was my neighbor. I mean, it was oh, nice. interesting. Nice. Yeah. I'm, and, sure, uh, I'm sure there are stories and, and you probably can't say some of them. <laughs> oh, Knowing yeah. her. Yep. What brought you to Vegas? Uh, just, it, I think it's the best place to live personally. I mean, it, you, it's easy in, to get in and out of it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, people pay to come here. It's true. A lot of people pay a lot of money, maybe not so much to get there, but while they're there, I was there a, oh, yeah. a well, few years ago and it's, uh, it's a remarkable place. There's a lot going on. Yeah. And the martial oh, yeah. arts scene there gotta, is interesting. Look, yeah. I'm sorry. You go to the outdoors. 
Yeah. No, it said the outdoors. If you love the outdoors, it has it. If you if you sure. like uh, shows, good dining, it has it. Uh, there's always something to do. And that's that's what I really love about it here. And so, it's you know it's, it's a fairly conservative town, con contrary to what people would think. Mm. You know, um, whereas other parts of you know Nevada are of course very liberal. You know, it's yeah. it's just it's just such an interesting dichotomy. You know, so yeah. Yeah, I, I was out there for a few days for work and waking up at 7 a.m., 6.30 a.m. I was the only person up, it seemed, yeah. on the strip. There was nobody, there was nobody awake in downtown. They were, because, you know, I was going to bed at 12, one o'clock and they were, they were still going hard. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I've seen people, uh, I always thought, you know, God, when COVID hit, I was thinking, what a great opportunity to like walk the streets and take pictures and mm. video of me walking with everything not open and saying, you know, make a doomsday movie. Absolutely. <laughs> right Absolutely. There. Well, didn't, I mean, um, was it Army of the Dead that was shot that at least takes place in Vegas? I don't know if you caught that. It was on Netflix. It, it, I don't really it watch acclaim. any horror films. Okay. I just, I just don't. Um, I've seen enough of the real life warmer in my life. <laughs> For sure. Well, uh, you know, we're here to talk about martial arts and we're here to yes. talk about your journey. So let's, let's go back. Let's go all the way back. The, um, the analogy I like to use for people, you know, if there was a comic book series based on your life as a martial artist, what would be in the first issue? Wow, well, I'm not familiar with a comic book series, so I really wouldn't even know, know where to begin. Um, I guess the best parallel would be the Karate Kid. Mm. Uh, that's a good parallel of kind of like what happened in my life. Um, and in fact, when I did the movie Force Five, I did the movie Force Five with uh, Fred Weintraub and Pat Johnson and him. I told him my story, and and Pat told me later that became the inspiration because uh, at the lunch apparently the writer was sitting right next to him oh funny and uh we went on and then the writer actually says yeah it was based on a kid who they met in the valley who told them a bit of their story and and and, and my journey my doctor wash on wash off that kind of thing he was a gardener just like miyagi was mm -hmm. um he used to he used to i used to meet him at the sago nursery on Burbank Boulevard, which was right across the street from the apartment I was living in as a kid. And then I would go work with him and he would show me things and do menial tasks. And in exchange for those menial tasks, he would show me how they were actually martial art moves. And, and he was really teaching me martial arts. And then he just, he was, he taught me more about how to, uh, I should say, more about how to fish how to do it for myself rather than okay mimic me and this is what you do and it was a very different approach and i got to thank him for that you know so there's certainly a dichotomy in the martial arts about perspectives how far can you go on your own right whether that's for a long period of time or a short period of time you know most people advocate some some manner of, yeah. of instruction yeah. Well, here's the, reality. here's the reality of it. People are taught because of schooling to, for, to look for plural approval before they act. Mm. Okay. They won't, they'll see a mur murder taking place in front of them, but until somebody jumps in, they don't jump in or a fire. And that's because of the way people are conditioned from childhood. I grew up in a very, you know, poor family. My parents were, you know, survived the Holocaust. Um, they, you know, I, I learned right off the bat never to look at the government to take care of me. You know, that which is a very important lesson uh, because I didn't look to the police to protect me. I didn't look to for justice anywhere except whatever I could find for myself. And that included education. You know, if I wanted an education, I had to, I had to find it on my own. And so um, I think if people who took more responsibility for their actions and come into the world and are taught that you are responsible for your own actions, your own education, 
without looking to other people to give you things, you need to work at it, we'd have an entirely different world, a different society. But the way tyranny works is they want dependency. So what they do is they try to build in dependency. People who are in power want you dependent on them. So you answer to them so they can order you around. Their greatest fear is we become independent. That's why you're seeing the disintegration of the middle class. Because when people start to get to the middle class, all of a sudden they had the time to think about things. They had time to evaluate, wait a minute, is, is this really in my best interest to do this? Is it really in our best interest to go to war? I mean, you saw that with Vietnam. People started mm -hmm. protesting against Vietnam. Why are we in Vietnam? What, what, are, what is the real goal here? And uh, this was really, this is an important aspect. So what do they do? You know, they, like I said, they, they create this, this idea of, uh, dependency that we need and, and it's just if you really pay attention to how education systems are structured are they really educating us or are they conditioning us i mean the, the big myth is you need to go to college and be successful no you don't the majority of successful people in the united states never went to college you know they it's just the opposite they started their business careers early and were debt free they weren't saddled with these sure. huge college debts you know, a good majority of them who made their money went into real estate and they started off as like guys working in a construction yard, lifting bricks, doing day labor, saving money, getting a place, turning it to a rental property, leveraging it. And before you know it, they're multimillionaires today. Now, th this, yeah, we, this mindset, this, this approach, are you, are, are you crediting, the, crediting this, this first? And, and did you, didn't you mention his name, this, this gentleman that well, taught so, you martial arts? Yeah, Senzo came, you know, came from okay. the East. He, he's, he's really attached to the Sakata clan and, uh, gosh, the Tanaka clan, of course, out of Japan. They have a long lineage of serving the emperor, which is interesting. And his family, I guess, kind of broke away. So that, mm -hmm. it, it was, in a way, it broke um, those familial ties or that, 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 regimented thinking you know japan's very orderly very regimented and flexible sure. um in their and in, in their in their thinking which also works don't don't get me wrong it's i'm not making an equation of this is right or this is wrong i'm just talking about the reality of of where your life can go depending on your mindset mm -hmm. and mindset is really important I, one of the first things i teach my students is the first and most important thing you have to learn is perspective if you cannot maintain your perspective you've lost control you're no longer in control of yourself sure. you know right if you don't have proper perspective you can't see danger you can't perceive danger and you walk right into it at the same time you can't see opportunities by which you can take advantage of them and uplift yourself so that's one of the things that he was really ideal and and reinforcing in my life is to maintain a a good perspective and, and, and take responsibility for my own actions. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I went to work when I was, you know, 12 and a half years old, because we just didn't have enough money at all. My mother was sickly all the time. And I just, I remember, you know, scrubbing for a dollar, I would clean an entire apartment building for a manager who was getting paid, you know, obviously, you know, several hundred dollars for the same job. Yeah. Okay. But I don't complain about it because I did enough of it. Where else was I going to find that work? And that money I got allowed me to put food on the table for my family. It, it gave me an opportunity that otherwise I wouldn't have had. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I ended up in the Marine Corps, you know, same thing is there just wasn't enough to go around at all. So was that, was that attitude that I guess approach of, of fending for yourself, providing what you needed, whether we're talking about, you know, money for the family or, or martial arts uh, guidance, you know, looking within, was that aligned with what your parents taught you? Or was that in contrast? Very much, very much aligned with my parents taught me. My father, you know, had to escape Nazi Germany or not Austria, actually, at the age of 13. So he had to fend for himself at 13. My mother was left on her own when she was 14. So they, they had those values instilled and they were being hunted and tried to be killed at that time in history. If you're a Jew, I'm sorry, they, they got you, you went, you went to a concentration camp or they shot you, what my mother saw. She worked in a factory, for example. She got a job in a factory in Hungary and she was very lucky because she was very good with mathematics and her 
uncle had arranged her to have a real soft like secretarial job but she, she, for some odd reason she could she wasn't just she couldn't make it work for her so as an alternative they let her go to work in quality control right. and build radio tubes and she was able to do all these high complex slide rule measurements and things and one day the it wasn't then the germans who came in it was the actual the hungarian police who came in and she tells a story and it's really it's it's tear jerking when she tells it because you could hear her, her eyes well up with tears and and what have you and I, and i'll remind you she's maybe 16 years old at this time and they, they came in and they lit, read out a list of names and one of her names her name was read out and she was let outside and she's put against the wall okay at the same time she's looking at other names of people and they're being collected and it's a vast majority of these young girls and she remembers her best friend who's pregnant at the time and they walk them into the middle of this huge lilac garden in the, at the factory compound and she remembers this policeman wearing this green feather in his cap and on a white horse and all of a sudden the trucks that they had the, everybody thought they were going to be taken away in these trucks the the rag curtain came down and all these young girls were machine gunned right before her eyes. Sure. And then she was told, and then she listens to this comment coming from a balcony while other people watch this. And, and a person laughs out, oh, look at the Jews, they didn't have to work a full day. I mean, that's the kind of crap it, that was impressed upon my mother. And she made it very clear to me, you know, about the cruelties in life. And, and again, you know, how she was spared, you know, by her skill sets, having something valuable will say, can save your life. When I started out as a young boy, I didn't, I wasn't learning martial arts so much as to be a great martial artist. I wanted to be a teacher, hmm. I wanted to teach it. So that set me on a path to learn as much as I could I didn't have the monies to go into a school and where the kids would be turned away. What I would do is I figured out what, what can I do to kind of learn? And I would go over to Bill Riyosaki's school called Rio Dojo. It was on Lancashire Boulevard. I'd get off of, uh, in junior high, I'd get out of school. And this is before I met uh, Tanaka, so just slightly before I met him. And uh, he, he would basically, you know, you know, I, I, ba I basically would, would go over there and I, they had a Chinese restaurant like a couple doors down and I would clean the Chinese restaurant in exchange. They would give me their cleaning supply and allow me to clean the window sidewalk of the school. And I did that for several other schools too, by the way. And in exchange, Bill would open up the blinds. He would, he, he, he saw what I did and he would let me learn from on the street, on the street. And, and, and he would kind of make gestures like, no, no, turn your foot this way or that. Well, the other kids weren't looking, you know, they're busy in the class. He's teaching you through the window. You know? And he would come out to, yeah, and he, and he would come out to try to get me and, and I'd run away. I was always afraid, you know, I don't know what it was, but I was, I, I, I was afraid that he thought maybe I'm stealing his lessons or something, but I was, you know what I mean? How old were you but at it, that point? Oh, gosh, uh, just turned 13. Okay. 15 years old, about 14, just, just right in there. And it was just before I met Tanaka. I met Tanaka, I think when I was really closer to 15 years old, you know, 14, 15. So, and yeah, and, he, and then I would go down to Bong Su Han school and Bong Su Han had a, had a school uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard and, and he, he converted a, uh, a garage, you know, uh, you know, yeah, with like four, it was four or five bays, you know, and and he turned that into a studio. Mm. And uh, and above his windows, uh, his mirrors, excuse me, above his mirrors, he had this uh, calligraphy, and the calligraphy stood for benevolence, courage, valor, wisdom. It was three symbols, but it, had, it meant four things. Mm. And those four things became, or those those four symbol, the three symbols. If you look at my patches you'll see those three symbols in there today 
And those four things were the secret to developing or what they call mind, no mind in martial arts, or what they say is called motion, where you're dead to temptations, you control, remember that from your perspective, you control your angers, your emotions. Because what it really means is you have to have the, the courage to take on new ventures. When things become overwhelming, you have to have the valor to meet your obligations in the face of overwhelming odds. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to uh, have benevolence to, to show to, towards your worst enemy because a true warrior turns a, a negative into a positive, mm -hmm. right? And when you can do all those things, you're doing it because you're coming from a place of wisdom, not because of, a, of from a place of emotion. Mm -hmm. Because the other elements are all emotional states of mind. And it goes back to what we're talking about, maintaining perspective. And so when you're able to divorce yourself from emotion, think logically through the situation, you can arrive at the, at the right resolution or answer to resolve whatever conflict is in front of you. Sometimes that's negotiate a negotiation. Sometimes striking for you know that's the reality of it and so i took those principles when i first started teaching and i was gosh 19 years old when i did it, it was 1975 and what i did was i didn't want to call myself a sensei because that's a japanese term for teacher i don't want to call myself sifu because that's a chinese term for teacher the traditional words and i was not a traditional martial artist i was self-taught essentially. Yes, I had many instructors, but I came up with my own system, which I called Duke's Roo, which means flows from Duke's. That's what Roo means, flows, mm -hmm. river, comes out of me. And so to be completely honest with everyone I was dealing, I invented the word Shidoshi, Shido, four ways. And the last she is the Chinese symbol for corpse. I picked three symbols or mm -hmm. words from three different arts, she being four in Japanese, the Do being uh, the way in Korean, like Taekwondo, or right? Tang Soo Do, people can relate to that. And the last one was Chi, which was Chinese, which was the symbol for the force within you or corpse, life and death. So it's four ways of the dead, or, or the four ways of being dead, a motion. Right? And I wanted my students to what? ascend to that level. And as I'm the teacher, what am I doing? I'm uplifting him to that level of Shidoshi. And that's how I came up with that symbol. Uh, we used it in blood sport. Now everybody in the world's running around. I'm a Shidoshi. I'm a Shidoshi. I'm a Shidoshi. <laughs> There's and I'm a, like, uh, I'm going, oh, and it's not a Japanese word, you know? Right. You can look at it. There, the, the way you're talking about that sounds very, reminds me of, of like monks, you know, just, just this, this talk of, let's progress past the point of needing the, the, the baggage or being bogged down in, you know, emotion. And, and was there, was there a religious element to that for you? What kind of element? Did religious? Say? No, it was just truth. Okay. Dealing in truths, you know, dealing in my journey, dealing what my parents taught me, observable realities. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that simple. Nothing comes out of a heated argument mm. except hurt feelings. You know, you're not gonna sure. you're not gonna prevail by you know uh, in some situations. You're gonna end up losing the situation, especially if the guy's a better linguist than you. I mean, mm. it's like trying to have an argument with somebody in Chinese and you don't speak Chinese. Okay, <laughs> that's a good example. Of it's it. not gonna work well. It's not gonna work well. But if you take the apart the emotion and you take and you work from a logical point of view you can diffuse anything for example and this comes under my principles one of the things i teach is i call the triangle of force all life works off a triangle of force if you really want to win in combat the whole secret is you maintain your triangle of force on your opponent and deny them the triangle of force on you okay um okay and that has to do with the geometry involved in fighting i mean it's just it's it's really simple and, and i I can prove it over and over again. I've done it. And that's why my system is used by the United States Navy SEALs and probably the best elite forces around the world. Because what I developed was a way to bypass the amygdala and access the frontal cortex of the brain. I'm not really teaching new techniques. I'm teaching them a new way to access it. And that's what made my style so deadly. And that's what made my style so uh, versatile, and that's why you'll see Duke's New Ninjutsu, Duke's Root Taekwondo, Duke's Root Judo, 
MMA, uh, urban combatives, Krav Maga, because they're taking these principles, I'm telling you, and mm. we're applying it to the application technology that people are taught, and it makes them better. It actually, you know, it, it's it's a real game changer. Uh, good example of that is, I would say, contact uh, this guy named Jesse James uh, Tucker. He, Jesse hounded me for two years to to teach him. I was retired. My wife said, no, this guy seems very sincere. So okay, come on out. And I told Jesse what I had him do when he first came out to visit with me. He goes, that's impossible. There's no way you can do that. When he left, he was like, it, it, it works. It, it really happened. And this is a guy who is an experienced teacher and has well over 20 years in the martial arts. And he walked away like, you know, like he just took his first step mm. in this journey. And, and that's kind of what I do is I try to teach at these days, the higher concepts. I try to make myself available to all instructors and say, look, I'm not here to change your system. I'm here to change you and make you better at it, how to communicate better with it. And really understand what I call the laws of combat. Too many people uh, sit down and they think they know martial arts and it's through no fault of their own. Okay. It's through the lack of education that's available no one has actually sat down like I have and identified what I call the laws of combat. And there are direct laws, reproducible re results. If you follow these formulas, you will get this result, period. And there are certain styles that work certain formulas and why they work. And this is where they break down. And when you understand that. Can you, you give can an example? I, I, I think I get you, but I'm not. Can, can you share? Okay, give me an example. I'll give me an example. Okay. Krav Maga. Krav Maga okay. is based on a principle called Badco, okay? Burst, attack, destroy, circle to the oblique. That's their whole, that's their whole game plan. Okay. Um, grappling is based on the principle of trapping. You have to, you tra you're trapping the guy. You're drawing him in or you got to get close and you have to end manipulation. Um, and, and those are just some simple principles. You sure. know, uh, all of them work along the principles of focus, action, skill, strategy, tactics, what I call fast. If you really want to get someone, all you have to do is disrupt any one of those five points and you, and you, you win the gunfight, for example. If I take away your focus, your ability to see, I win. Sure. That's simple. So people aren't identifying things in that way. It's like, okay, he throws a punch and I'm going to throw a punch back. Why? Why? Because you, you're trying to see, that's my point. You can't explain it. <laughs> you've not been taught how to explain. It. Sure, you're right. Okay, you throw a punch back because you're trying to you're trying to hit him with overwhelming force. Okay. Okay, and you're and you're hoping that your overwhelming force will determine the outcome. Bottom line. Okay. That makes how sense. do I? How, what's another way to de defeat his overwhelming force? Take away his ability to see. Okay. You stepping forward to punch me in the face, and I throw I throw you know fireplace ash mixed mm. with uh, glass in your eyes. Who wins that fight? Uh, probably you, right? I definitely win the fight because you don't uh, you don't expect it. Sure. You're coming from a perspective of I'm going to punch you. You don't see that coming. That's what made ninjutsu so um, dangerous as a, as a principle. It's like what I was taught by my instructor. It was like, no, you, you have to, you don't fight on their terms. You fight your fight. Okay. That's keeping you in my triangle of force and you, and me not being in your triangle of force. What are the you points on the triangle? Well, let, let me explain the triangle in, 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 in human terms. Okay. Another way to look at it. Okay? Uh, are you married at all? I'm not. Or, or significant, been in a significant relationship? I, I have been. Yes. Okay. So on one side of the triangle, there is you. The other side of the triangle is your significant other, okay? And then together, the base is the two of you together, all right? Okay, okay you see that? Mm -hmm. So that's how the world sees you. So you have a triangle, that you got that. What can make bring you in closer together is what we call a third dynamic. It's what runs center line in martial arts. Just like if we're fighting, okay, I have a center line. Whoever dominates the center line wins. Okay. Wing Chun is based on that. Right. Yep. So I take that same principle, like you see in Wing Chun, and apply it to my life in that way. So, what do we know about the center line? Well, it, what 
the center line can be is what we call, uh, I call a dynamic of conflict, okay? Because all the dynamics happen there, mm -hmm. right? Exchange blows, we, we deflect, okay? You get caught cheating, what do you do? You're trying to deflect. No, I wasn't mm -hmm. cheating, right? Makes sense. Okay, and that element can, can bring you together or it can destroy you. Maybe it say, yeah, I was caught cheating. And I'm cheating because, you know, you're not putting out, <laughs> right? Having a direct conversation makes the other person go, oh, shit, you know, I'm not meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. That's a human real reality or, or it's financial problems. In a marriage, that's what it can be. People don't address that dynamic. They just play this game and go around the triangle until it finally kind of spreads apart. You know, you have your triangle and eventually what happens to that base? There's no triangle anymore, is it? When you split, right. there's no base. Two different Glasses. halves again. That's my point. Okay. So you can take the same principles of martial arts, is what I teach with that triangle force model, and we can apply it to our lives and make it better. And that's what martial arts really was really all about. It's about resolving conflict without violence and with mutual benefit. Sure. That's where people forget. You have to have mutual benefit. Otherwise, any peace you have will not last. Okay? There Unless you're dealing, of course, with a psychopath, then it's a totally different story. There may be some folks listening who know, know you, know your history, and they're finding that statement about martial arts. Uh, Maybe, maybe it's coming across as, as something unexpected, perhaps odd, coming from you. Have you always had that perspective on martial arts? Have you always seen it that way, or did that change? No, I've always seen it that way. I started off with my models and, and, and learned that. That's why I had such success. That's why you, you have to understand, I have had an orchestrated effort of a magnitude you cannot believe to try to drive me out of the martial arts industry because I speak the truth. Mm -hmm. And the, tr and the truth makes people who are forced to be changed by it angry. Mm. They resist it. They will hate you for it. Okay? Um, and, th and this is this is the reality. You know, I force, I force a lot of change in the industry. I wouldn't go along with the, the illusory business of it. Where people are saying, oh, we do this, we do that, and said, no, you don't. You're not ethical. You can't be sitting here and telling me you're teaching kids to be upright standing, you know, people and have dong strong disciplined minds while you're going in the back room and you know, you know, doing a, a line of cocaine. Mm. Okay. It's not a it's not a, a judgment call. It's a, it's a sign of why would you do that? It's gonna hurt your body. Mm. Why are you working contrary to what you're teaching? You have to live what, what it is you're teaching. You, you're just, you're being a bullshitter, you know? And I've, I've confronted people on that. And, and I gotta tell you, a lot of the best instructors I know come from the most sordid pasts. Oh, I'm thinking you know why? now. Because, no, go ahead. Because they they recognize their mistakes and then they're able to recognize them in others and say hey man i know what you're doing and mm -hmm. let's get you straight let's do this let's do that they can actually genuinely talk from a place of like knowledge and personal experience and understand what the other person's going through how find sympathy find compassion you know and i'm, I'm that's, and for others you know I, i'm going to infer that you'd include yourself in, in that group well, my journey was a little more different in the sense of I never was engaged in any form of substance abuse. I can't speak to substance abuse, okay? But I can, again, that's where I come from the point of using the technology and, and, the, and, the, and I can approach them and so say, why are you doing something that's counterproductive to you and show them how the martial arts model works, for example, and how they can apply it to their life, hmm. okay? I'm not as effective, I'll be honest with you, as a guy who I've had in my studios who was a substance abuser, who, who has learned the technology, and he's reaching out to that kind of person. That, that 
I can tell you right now, that person, that one of my instructors who actually went through that, he's far greater at, at, at that than I am. Okay, I know my limitations, you know? Um, but the point is I was the one who actually identified it and was able to teach that so they can use that, you know? And he's able to educate me to, hey, you know, here's the medical realities of one person, let's say uses substances, how it creates different, uh, you know, pathways in the brain and, 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 and how they fire and how they get, they, they have these pleasure, pleasure points and they're, they're amplified. And that's why the people keep trying to get a hit to get that, get that back because it's the receptors are, are, there are more receptors now because of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so I've educated myself to, 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 again, to understand what people struggle with, but I could never know unless I went through it myself how difficult that may be you know or what that physically feels like you know i mean i don't have to cut off my hand to have compassion for somebody who lost their hand it's true, it's true. okay and so and help them and that's and that's again it's the technology it's understanding the interrelationship between martial arts or the, what i call the laws of combat and behavior and how we can change the world. And one of them is, like I said, just the first thing we're talking about, maintain perspective. How do you maintain perspective? You know, and you, and you keep that. And, and one of the, it's probably one of the things that really has held me through a lot of this. I mean, I have people actively lying about me every day, appearing in videos, making claims that are just, if anybody bothered to just do the simple research, they know that they're not true. Like my instructor never existed. Okay. You can go on ancestry.com and do a search and you see Sins of Tanakh existed. Okay. But people will continue with that lie. You know, oh, the Kumite doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, it does. We have the, it's been going on since the 30s and 40s. You can look at it. You know, I was on uh, a show called Viking Samurai, and I actually had to explain to people the, the math involved. And I really recommend people, if you're hearing, oh, it's impossible because of the math, go, go, to, go to Viking Samurai on uh, YouTube, look his, up the podcast, and it's called Kumite Math, where I explain it in detail. And you'll understand that there's, it holds no water because it, what it is is, again, people are being deceptive for their own, their own agenda, serving their own agenda. And they're trying to rationalize or use, um, you know, math and pervert it in a way by creating a different kind of model for what it is. You know, we're talking Asian martial arts. The Asian mindset is circular. The Western mindset is linear. Mm -hmm. And you, when you and when you understand that, you understand that I'm teaching real martial arts. I competed in a real martial art competition, whereas most. Martial art competitions today are not real martial arts. They're, they're traditional Asian martial arts, I should say. They are martial arts, but they're not traditional Asian martial arts like I competed in. Why? Because they're all linear. It's all brackets. It's single elimination. It, it didn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have a circle in the old days, 60 fighters, and you'd step to the left after you fought the next guy. And whoever was left standing, that's how you kind of figured out who won. Mm. Interesting. When, if, if you look at how people form opinions or, or how they present opinions, we, right. we know plenty of research in psychology has shown that people start with an emotional response and they will backfill logic or data or math to justify right. what they believe. And, you know, I, I'm... The last thing I'm going to do is step into your story and say anything about your story because it's not my story. I, I, I could talk about my story, yes. but it doesn't take long looking around at any aspect of the world to see, oh, there's an emotional decision that someone shoehorned, you know, a data point or logic or, you know, that person said this, so it must be true to justify it to themselves. So they, don't feel like it's solely an emotional response. Oh yeah, and I agree with you there. But the other thing is you have to understand, what we have to consider is people serve agendas. Many mm -hmm. many of them are hidden agendas. 
uh, some of the agendas aren't even known to the person who's doing it. They have a deep emotional issue going on and they're projecting whatever it is that they are seeing onto somebody else. Yep. For example, I know guys who are absolute frauds in the martial arts, but they're the biggest accusers of fraud to, of everyone else. They have websites dedicated to revealing fraud, yet if you look into their background, they were translators. They weren't really martial arts. Mm -hmm. They really didn't absorb. They went through the motions. They, they dress. They role play. And that's the difference. There's, there's a difference between role playing a martial arts and actually becoming one. Mm. What's and the difference? To become, one, uh, to become one, it requires a high level of ethic. And a good example of that is I look at this uh, mega weekend going on in Atlantic City that's going to come up. All these so-called respectable martial artists are going in there to get awards that they paid for. It's a marketing tool. They're deceiving the public that this is an earned award. So I, I, I do want to be careful of calling out specific people. That's a, a line we try, really try to not cross on this show. Well, I'm not calling out anyone. I'm okay. calling out an event. I'm calling out a, I'm calling out a reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the reality is this. When a person does that, they're not, har they're not only harming the public, they're harming themselves. They're, when they have a real achievement, how does that measure up anymore? It, it has no value of accomplishment. So it's the same principle of everyone gets a trophy. Every kid participates in it and gets a trophy. Where is the lesson in that for a child? You're always going to be taken care of. You're always right. going to come out a winner. And we certainly agree on that point. In fact, we did an episode a few years ago about why I, I strongly disagree with participation trophies. Right. And that's exactly what you're seeing in that, those events. That's my point. And we as martial art leaders and the leaders of schools, we need to stand as the example for, the, for others. Mm. So how can you be an example and preach what we're talking about, like no participation trophies? Okay, and learn the lessons, the hard lessons of life and learn that, hey, if you want something, you really got to work hard at it, harder than the next guy. If you destroy that lesson, how could you say you're being an ethical uh, person and you're, you're being the example of the children? You're not. And that's why I'm against it. It has nothing to do with personalities. And there's a different way to reframe the context of these, of these events. We could still have these events, but they're not, they're not done in the right frame context. And this is the problem because everybody's looking for the pat on the back. They're looking to be famous for famous sake. They think if they're famous, that'll bring them happiness or that they make that much more money, they're gonna be happier. Or if they get the big house, they're gonna be happy. Or they're gonna, you know, they got the, the, the fancy boat they're gonna be happy. And you know how many people I've watched blow their brains out who've gotten everything they've gotten in life that they thought would make them happy? Happiness starts from within. Happiness actually comes from giving to others, believe it or not. So, so, how, so how do we address that? Because what you're talking about, whether we look at it as a, a martial arts issue, wanting the pat on the back, or we look at it as a societal issue or a global issue, it's real, right? There, a lot of people are, are desperate for validation wanting to feel like they're good enough like they measure up in some way right if we can if we dial it's that stop, into look, martial art look, go ahead look and i'm going to stop you right there because it goes right back to what I, why we I, I wanted to talk about perspective sure they're looking for validation so where are they looking outward in martial arts where are you supposed to look inward and that's the lesson. That's what people need to learn. And that's what they need to practice. How do we teach you that? You become something by doing the opposite. Okay. I cannot be a sober person by drinking every night. <laughs> that is true. Okay. And that's what they're doing. They're drinking in this, this thing that creates an illusion for them. It temporarily gives them an escape, but it's only a temporary escape. It's not facing the issues the underlying issues. That's the problem of substance abuse. There's something else working at it. And that's why people are doing it. It's a way of deadening the pain. Mm -hmm. 
They're not addressing what the issues are. Activism, a great example of this, fanatical activism. If you look at most fanatical activists, you'll see that they come from a real trouble childhood or past or something traumatic in their life. And they're so vested in this activism because it's an escape from them having to look inward and deal with what they need to deal with and correct what they need to correct at home. Sure. Our, our, a master, a grandmaster is supposed to teach masters and people below them how to implement that in their lives, change a community by it, enrich people's lives by it. I can't do that by being unethical or going along with, with a practice that I know is not correct, that's telling people, yeah, look outward. Let's reinforce this looking outward crap. This is, this is my issue with it. And, and people have to understand that it has nothing to do with a personal issue whatsoever, okay? The only, I've only gone to a couple of halls of fame and I've actually been a keynote speaker at one. And I actually talked about this very issue at that hall of fame and I got a standing ovation. It was the, the master's hall of fame with Dan Heck. He told me it was probably the most moving speech he'd ever heard in, in his system, mm. okay? At least Dan Heck does it right. He has some kind of a screening, screening process, if you will, for getting that validation. Whereas other guys, it's like, hey, fill out, you've been selected. Just pick your, pick your award. You want to be MMA champion of the year and never fought an MMA fight in your life? There's one guy, he's, he's getting an award this weekend. He's zero and three. You know, I can respect that he participated, but he's getting a participation award. Let's be honest. He didn't achieve anything. He's, he, he's only fooling himself. He's, he's, he's cheating himself out of real victory. It's like, I've had people walk in and say, I want to be a black belt. Like I walk, I just walk into the drawer and I say, here you go. Nice meeting you. And they're like, what? You want to be a black belt? No, no, no. I want to, and I make them see their own, what they really want. Right. And then, you know, what's great about that? I had people in my system who never got a black belt their 20 years and they have no problems with it. They never said, Oh, I've got 10 years in grade. And no, it's a level of competency. It's what, what is your level of competency and ability? And they're happy with it. And they are respected by the other students because they keep trying at it. I, I, I've got a question for you then, because you, you, you're pulling on a thread that is really personal for me. And, and depending on the day I go back and forth on, on how I feel. Has rank served us? as a community and industry or has it harmed not, us? It, well, rank is nothing more and it's, you gotta put it, again, let's get the, put it in the right perspective. Okay. If you're getting rank to be validated, it's you're doing a disservice. If you're selling rank in your school as a, as a, um, as a way of validation, you're doing that person a disservice. Mm -hmm. If you're using it as a barometer as a form of measurement, as a form to make sure that, hey, I'm not gonna pit this guy against another guy in a sparring match where he ends up you know, going out horizontally at a class, then it's valid. And that's why rank was invented. There was no ranks in martial arts until it became a sport, until they started to turn, turn jujitsu and into, into judo into sport. And the very, very first judo matches, by the way, are what the MMA rules are today. You could punch the face. You could do all the things that you see today. That was judo, okay? And, and, and they needed, just like you have an amateur and you have uh, professional MMA matches and how you rank people, they, that's why they instituted the belt system. It was taken from the top hats that the bureaucrats used to wear in Japan. Mm. The level of, of supervision. That's why you have a black one. The black came about because that was the top bureaucrat. <laughs> you see, hmm. the lowest one was a white white top hat. And then they turn it into belts. Okay. Is there, so given, given the current climate with belts, which, which yes. do you think we should address? Should we be addressing? Sorry, I'm turning off my phone. That's okay. I no thought worries. it was off. <laughs> yeah. you, you, certainly not the first I've even had my phone make noise. You know, I've been doing this for years and it still once in a while I mess up. Would it be easier to address the perspective 
that you're talking about, or would it be easier to address the rank if we wanted the, the faster way to start making some changes? Where do you think we should put effort? All of us learning the lesson, and I call it, the, it's the most, it's the first lesson of martial arts, the first law, perspective, maintain perspective. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to do. I, I, I'm, I'm here trying to re-educate instructors and saying, I love what you guys are doing, but here's where you're messing up. You, you, somewhere along the line, you weren't taught this lesson, you know, sure. and it's a lesson from history. So don't blame it as a lesson that your instructor didn't give you, you know, it, what, make, what makes us so respected as an industry or supposedly why martial arts were, were respected is because we had the proper perspective. We maintain the perspective. We're the guys who are supposed to stand in a crisis and stand up for people when they can't take care of themselves. I know when we had the earthquake in Mexico, my students immediately, the way I had trained them, rallied, found out everybody was everybody's family okay. And the ones that weren't, they went to the dojo and they had food and water. And then they went out and organize and start taking people out of buildings. And they were doing this hours before the police and ambulances or anybody responded. And they were, and they were just all over the city. I mean, cause we had schools everywhere mm -hmm. and they were just saving people left and right and organizing things. They, because of the way they were taught, maintaining perspective, right? Perspective is we got to protect the children. We got to do this. We have to have water. We have to do this. And we have to find out who's injured and organize. And they, and they did it in an organized fashion. They didn't look to the police. They didn't look to medical. They looked to themselves as a family. This is how we're gonna take care of ourselves. And now we're gonna take care of our community. And then we're gonna go outside that. Mm -hmm. And we can do that as martial artists. We should do that as martial artists. And we need to reframe these halls of fame. I'm not saying we can't have them. I'm saying we need to reframe them. They need to be put in the proper perspective not cheapen the arts, not turn it into a, a circus. Start reinforcing where people look look um, inward as opposed to outward. We have a, a wide swath of people all over the world. I mean, the one thing they really have in common is they speak English and they have likely some training, but at least some interest in martial arts. Now, a lot of what you're talking about, I'm sure folks who've been around a few decades, they're dialed in. What about someone who has been training maybe a year or two and they're hearing you and they're saying, you know, I, I get it, it makes sense. I don't know if I'm learning from that kind of a person. What would you advise of them? It goes right back to what I told you before. Take responsibility for your own learning. Again, you know, his his own uh he has his own uh way of doing things okay sometimes you have to trust the process but at the same time like i said if you're watching a guy and he's a bully if he's not living up to what he's teaching you it's time to leave it's time to go find someone who can who walks the walk, not just talks the talk. That's what it really comes down to. And, and it's sad reality, but it's the truth. And, or you need to have that conversation with them and say, look, you know, I love you as a teacher, but you're messing up. Mm. It's a difficult conversation. Yeah, but you know what'll come out of it? You're, you're not sell, you're, you're, you're risking the relationship. Anyone who has a deep, meaningful relationship will always risk the relationship. Mm. Okay? To do what's right. You don't sell people out. You know, you don't enable people to continue to make mistakes. Think about how many people go down a wrong path. And, and, and I put it to people as simple. If you saw a blind man, he's about to step into heavy traffic. Would you grab him by the arm or would you let him go? Grab him. So why aren't you willing to grab somebody who's blind and what they're doing and they're about to get hit by a truck load of truths or or set, they're setting themselves up for this stepping off into this big chasm of failure. 
Why wouldn't you do that? You should. Where's your humanity? I agree. Where's your courage? Mm-hmm. Remember, uh, I told I, you it goes back to the Shibuji? Yeah. You have to have courage. And, and I think courage. that that's probably a good part of this is that you get enough people who don't have the courage to do the right thing, say the right thing, take the risk, risk the relationship. There are symptoms that are going to come out of that. It's actually not courage. It's conditioning. They've been taught to be, to look for plural approval. Okay. And the reason they do that is because they've not learned perspective. It all goes right back to perspective. We can unfold this and I can take the layers off and I'll take it right back. It always goes right back to perspective. Maintain perspective. If you maintain the right perspective and you continue to walk that path, you will reach what you thought are unattainable successes in your life. And I've got, what I'm credited with 16 world records. I didn't get there because I pussyfoot around. I addressed my failures. I looked at my yeah. failures and said, hmm, how can I do this better? What am I doing incorrect? What, what can I do better than that? And how do I get to this level? And, and I didn't wasn't competing and looking for the journey as the end goal, at the goal. I was looking at the process. You know, life is enjoyable when you understand and you look at it not in, in, as, a, as like an attainment of certain materialistic things, but an attainment of, of memories. You know, that's why people who have all these wonderful things, but at the end of the life, they're jumping off of buildings is because there's no, nothing memorable in the journey to get there. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the people that I pay attention to of late express that as gratitude. You know, if you can dial in, if you can feel grateful, if you can recognize that other, other people, other events were responsible for getting you to where you are now. It's really hard to feel bad when you are also grateful. Here's a word, here's a, I'll give you a good example of this. And it's a hard one for people to swallow and think about. But I really want older young out there to think about it. Okay. Especially men who may feel abandoned by their father mm. or let down by their father or abused by their father. Rather than resent them. I want you to change your mental attitude. I want you to turn turn and put yourself in power. Empower yourself and thank them for what they did because he or whatever they did, even the most screwed up thing they ever did to you, they made you who you are today. Yeah. Okay? Be grateful that that happened to you as screwed up as that may be, because it put you on a path of who you are. And that's what I try to tell all these young men. And, I, and, I, and, and that's it. And, and you can do that. Then you can unshackle yourself from the horrors of the past. And you can not have to look into a bottle or look to be validated by others. And this is the issue. This is what's really going on is again, People are looking outside themselves, not looking inside themselves. That's why we, we, what we mean to be one with the universe in martial arts, one with yourself, where everything becomes within you, not out of you. And most people don't understand that. They just, they just hear the words. They don't understand the concept of taking everything that's out there, everything, and put it within you. You're one with it. You're not looking outside it. You've mentioned a few times students, schools. I, I'm going to imagine that there's some kind of, whether it's official or not, vetting process that you have if someone's going to become your student. Is this part of that? Do they have to be somewhere in terms of perspective for you to say, you know what, you're ready for me, you're not ready for me? No, because I've, I've never said no to a student, hmm. anybody who's come to me. I've never turned anybody away. I just always look at it as a challenge. Okay. Um, I'll give you a good example. I had a kid come to me who was in a wheelchair. Every instructor turned him away. I just said, okay, here's another challenge. 
I've got to take all these things I've learned and how do I improve this guy's life? How do I get him outside himself, not, not feeling sorry for himself? How do I teach him martial arts? And I told him, and I looked at his legs and I looked at his movement and I said, you know, and uh, they did a, a, a special on, uh, that's incredible on this, by the way. You can actually see it. You can hear the words from his own mother. Oh, cool. And I told him, I said, Left, so I'm going to get you up and walking. Hmm. And everybody looked at me like, wait a minute, the doctor said it's impossible. This is impossible. But I knew from my studies in, in Mongolian Chiwaka, and I could feel that I could reconnect the, the pulses, the, the connection. It's like rewiring. Like, so it's like an electrician going in a box and saying, hey, you know what? All these wires are broken, but I could take this wire and put it here, and I could put that wire over here, and it kind of it, it'll make it work. You know, it's Mickey Mouse, but it'll make it work, right? It, it was the same thing with him. I did I did the same thing, and and you can see in the video, I got less. You know, walk, he was walking like a regular person, but he was walking. He was on his own two feet, mm -hmm. and he and he was able to cross the room to his mother for the first time. It's incredible. Okay? And that's on video. Uh, there's a guy named Justin Harvey. I met Justin. He was bound up. I mean, he hadn't moved in years. He was literally, I, I met Justin um, on the phone. I didn't even know what his condition was, but I invited Justin to come out. And he suffered from cerebral palsy to come out. And I said, I'll train him. Hmm. He's a big Bloodsport fan. He'd watch Bloodsport. Since the time he was three, and it's the only thing that got him through the day. So, and it was really kind. Of, it, it's I got, it's a really great stories with him. So I find Je Justin, and I'm I'm not kidding. He is like this. He can't even move his muscles. He's just locked in, frozen. And, and as I'm putting him in the car, I'll never forget it. He, you know, he 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 um he knocks off my hat. <laughs> by accident right <laughs> and the guy says those are fighting words but you know, that's fighting words but he goes oh shit where's frank thinks when i need him <laughs> and we just cracked up well justin will tell you you can get you should get him on your radio show you can he'll tell you about what it was like to spend those three weeks with me i had justin walking also wow. okay and in fact i had justin sparring Hmm. It's a very funny story. I took Justin to show you how it was. He always dreamed that he wanted to fight. He wanted to be able to fight, right? How, and so I started putting my thinking cap on. And again, maintaining perspective. I said, okay, I know how to do it. And I was living uh, at that time in Seattle on a lake. I had my own dock. And I took Justin down to the, to the lake and I invited some of my other students over. And, and, we were, and I taught him what, how to fight in water. You know? Yep. Put a life vest on Justin, I had another student, Sean Beebe, who I, I laugh at because Sean uh, doesn't know how to swim. I took him to the dock and, and, I, and, and the first thing I do is say, you ready, Justin? He says, goes, oh, shit. and I threw him in the water, just <laughs> threw him in. <laughs> and the guys were of course down below to help him, but he's, he's kind of paddling, you know, Justin's trying to, he's trying to stay afloat as he can with his vest. The guys were there. So you're going to be sparring today, Justin. I said, Sean, you ready to spar at Justin? He goes, but I can't swim. I said, well, it makes it fair. And I pushed him into the water. <laughs> and of course, and of course he, he's, he's floundering around and floundering around. And Sean, I go, Sean, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. You're not drowning. He was in waist high water. Right? But the point is, I took away Sean's ability to use his legs and maneuver in that in the water, and and the same thing held true with what Justin. And now I evened the tables, and they sparred, and Justin won. And Sean's going like, I got beat by a guy in a chair. You know, he, he goes, I go, yeah, you need to work at this, don't you? He goes, yeah, I do. All right, and it's it's a funny story, but. It's, it's, again, it all goes back to these lessons I keep telling. The first important thing you have to always remember, maintain perspective. You can change the world with the right perspective. You can change anything. It's just doing that, changing it up. What can I do different? What can I do different? How can I make this work? How can I make this work? And the answers will come to you, you know?
And that's, and that's the important thing. Instead of being in an argument with somebody and, and, and feeling yourself right, turn the argument around and start looking at things through their eyes. You know? And you'd be surprised at how you can change things in your favor. You know? I mean, I had a guy and, and before he could say anything, hey, 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 I, I cut you off, I'm sorry. It's like, can I, what can I do to make it right? I, I need to make, I feel terrible. You understand? Or my wife, oh my God, my wife was brilliant. I got a great story for you here. Right. Absolutely brilliant. What she did was we were in a, in a vehicle and we're going to, at that time when we first came to Las Vegas, we lived in this uh, condominium complex. And we pulled in and there's plenty of ways to get around us. You just had to go around us. Whatever. And I pulled over for a, a phone call and I'm at the curb, by the way, right? But I guess I wasn't in the curb far enough for whatever guy was coming in to make that like right turn. And this guy, you could tell he'd been partying all night and he, and he was had an attitude and he's honking behind me. It's like, dude, just go around me, right? And I'm dealing with my call and she's honking and gets real upset. Finally, he pulls around in front of me. He gets out and he walks to my car, right? He opens the door and my wife's looking at me, oh my God, he's gonna kill him. You know, I'm ready to like, I'm ready to like nail yeah. this guy. On top of which the guy was half, really half my size I, when I really realized it later, <laughs> but he just had a really bad day. Sure. It was obvious he didn't drinking or something and uh, it was very aggressive. And my wife goes, oh, please, uh, um, you know, excuse us you know we just got terrible news you know we our 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 our, our mother's in the hospital and blah 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 and she really talked to him from a human point of view mm -hmm. you know the guy again she was smart enough to change the perspective of what the situation was for him he's going oh shit and he he was apologizing to us you understand yeah he couldn't do enough at that point and again what do we do there? She, yes, it wasn't maybe ethical to not tell a truth, but there are exceptions. And the exception is when you're going to avoid violence, when you're going to actually spare some greater injury. That became a tool. And in all warfare, it's based on deception. You know, Sun Tzu. So, yeah, you know, we use that tool. And again, what is all warfare? It's based on deception. What is deception? Changing people's perspective. And it all, again, it all comes down to that one little element. And if you start with the most basic thing of that and maintaining that in your life, like your integrity, like not going to these events, like I was telling you about. Here's the reality most people don't think about. A lot of people see these events, like we're talking about, um, as marketing tools. And I can, uh, I had businesses, I had that, I can see that. There's a, there's a, that's a valid argument. But what they don't see is the, uh, is the, it's a double-edged sword. At the same time, if you have all these trophies and, and belts and plaques in your office, and believe me, I got plenty of them. All right. I mean, I'm not going to do. Yeah. I mean, take yeah. a look. Listeners, for, for those listening, not watching the video, yeah, we're right. we're looking at a wall full of plaques. Okay. Anyways, my point is, if if you you have a client who turns around, or clients that see that you just and feel that you deceive them, that these weren't earned, you'll end up with an empty school. Sure. You'll have people calling you a fake and a fraud, and you could be one of the best and work the hardest all your life. And all of a sudden, because you look for that validation outside, you gave away your power. And they identify that you're looking for validation. And if you're looking for validation, how could you be someone they're seeking? You're supposed to be it, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So I just caution people, I, I, and it's... It is so easy for me to sit here and go along with the flow and not, not uh, rock the boat. 
okay? And be, make everybody feel really peaceful and oh boy, I'm glad he's there. But then I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't achieve to a position of leadership in the community if I was silent, if I was plural in my thinking. And that, and as a martial artist, we're not supposed to be. So that's, that's the important lesson I, I try to impart in people. And when you stop being plural in your thinking, every aspect in your life changes and you will be surprised at how life becomes that much sweeter because you're not looking outside yourself. You can really taste what things are going on. You can, you can start setting goals that you might otherwise have thought weren't possible. You know, think of all the inventions that came about because some, and, and people said, oh, that's impossible, it can't be done. But a lot of those. Right? right. I mean, here you are, you're on the, you have a radio show, right? Yeah. How many people have started out and say, oh, I'm gonna get a radio show and I'm gonna do this and that. And they say, oh, no, you don't. You don't know enough this, you don't know enough people. And what ends up happening? They don't do it. Yep. If you had listened to the negative voices that probably told you you couldn't do this where would you be i'd be back where they all are in fact we we've had a lot of that over the years and and now a lot of them is, there's some revisionist history going on oh yeah but my and that's my point my point is it goes back to plural thinking hmm. as a martial artist we're supposed to escape that that's why again it goes back to what i was telling you be one with others so what's next for you? Huh? you know, you're, 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 what's next for you? What if we if we were right to circle now, back in a few it, years? What what would have happened between now and then? It's not a, it's not a, uh, what's new for me. It's really of what am I going to do to continue my message and get it out there? And I think at this point I want to create a program, and I'm, and I'm not the one who created this, but I want to really redefine it. Okay. And and I want to put the martial arts back in martial arts. Mm. And I think one of the ways we do it is with a program I'm going to call, for better for lack of a better term, martial art therapeutics. Okay. It's a better way of understanding and reframing the context of what we're talking about, starting with like the lesson of perspective the next lesson i talk to people about is be dynamic in what you're doing and we could talk an hour or two on that alone as well i'm sure we could but that's what's that's what's next i think and and for me uh it's again it's part of the continuing journey you know one of my goals was when i when i first blood sport first came out and i had an opportunity to open a school in Beverly Hills. I had a guy who wanted to be my partner. He saw the financial gains of mm. franchising my name with Bloodsport coming out and setting up a string of schools and doing all this. And I had another guy come in my school and he, he wanted me to help him bring ninjutsu and martial arts to Mexico. Um, then Ricky Ford, and he had come to me before them, but he, 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 it was an impactful moment for me. And I found myself at a crossroads and I had to make a choice. And, and as, as a result, I chose not to go ahead with the multi-million dollar school franchise business that would have occupied all my time because that's what was being required of me. And I probably would have been set up for life and had a different, you know, different aspect of things. But um, I decided, you know what? I, I look inside myself for everything. What, what's going to be more meaningful for me? So I went to Mexico. And now we have schools all over Mexico. I put help build up the entire industry there with a guy named uh, Manuel Mondragon, who later became the national security director of the country. Hmm. Um, and David Moon, another fine gentleman who also brought Taekwondo there. I think he's got like 400 schools there. I mean, it's just maybe more, 1,400 schools. I take that back. 
Um, in fact, if you look at the first professional Taekwondo games, you'll see that it's Mondragon and myself. They're seated right next to uh, Grandmaster Moon for the first professional games held in Mexico. Oh, We're at cool. the head table. Nice. Okay. Um, in, yeah, and, and I'm very proud of the fact that I have a, a, an award that was given to me. I was told I was told I was the first and only four national to receive this award from the, the mayor of Mexico City. And for the programs we did there, and we, you know, like I said, right. I mean, I put together programs where we start out in the parks. That's how I started teaching martial arts. I was in a park. I didn't have a studio. I didn't have anybody to help me sh show me how to run a school. I had to learn as I as I went along. And I did the same thing in Mexico. So we have schools all over Mexico and in, in a variety of different things, Taekwondo, uh, Kempo, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, mixed martial arts, kickboxing, urban combatives, um, uh, Krav Maga, I can go on and on. They're all Duke's Root related. We have schools, you know, um, we call all these schools, we put them under one banner. We call it the uh, Circle of Iron. It's a circle where we all kind of work in, as, as a, like, the, like the Knights of the Round Changer. Everybody's equal and we all work together and it's not about rank. Rank is something separate. That's, that's just sort of like, you know, a, a measuring tool. So, so if it's, if, if I may, it, yeah. it sounds like you've built this incredible group of people. And if it, if it truly is, I, I'm imagining that you, when you selected that imagery, you know, a round table, that you took it to heart. You don't sound like someone who just casually chooses no. things. What have they taught you? Well, let me tell you this, from, from all of this, I caught the attention of the World Organization for Peace, and now I'm a delegate. I'm this delegate for Nevada for, for the organization. Mm -hmm. And that organization, just for those people who aren't familiar with it, they're the ones who brokered the peace treaty, if you will, or the meeting between the president of North and South Korea. It wasn't the, they're the ones who did that and organized that, um, which is kind of an interesting Looks like the recording had an auto started. My apologies. We continue we'll, we'll make it work we'll make it work this is not how okay. we normally run things. Can we start again <laughs> sure no okay i'll just start here where i was saying just the, the thing about the organization is that it's it's about promoting harmony and through harmony we're able to resolve issues and and in a non-political way so we have sustainable solutions to social problems That's a great place to, to start to fade out. So we, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff here and likely and intentionally, not some of the things that maybe you would have expected, some of the listeners would have expected because I don't like doing the same interview. Everybody does. We got, we got, I got to know you. you know, I got to know what makes you tick and that's what I was most interested in. So as, as we, we fade here, I leave this part up to the guests. What are what do you want to leave people with? You know, we, we've got an hour plus a conversation that they can go back and listen to, watch anytime they want. But you've given speeches, you've given successful speeches. You know that the way things end is pretty important. So how do you want to end this? What are your kind of final thoughts, final words to the folks paying attention want, to our I conversation want, today? I want people to really take to heart what it is I said, think about it, take the time to digest it. Um, and know that they have, that they themselves are special. They don't have to look outside themselves for validation. Mm -hmm. It will come. It comes from doing the opposite of what you think it is. The harder you work at trying to chase it, the more elusive it'll be. Fame comes through Actions, not words, not staged events, actual real contribution. And it comes from within you. It's, it's the way it shines through you. And that, again, goes back to what we were talking about here. And that was my first lesson I teach all my students when they walk in the door. And that is maintain perspective. You know, don't sell yourself out. Don't cheapen yourself from having a victory. 
Don't make your life hollow. You know, take stock in who you are. Love yourself. You know, if you if you when you feel the need to to escape, ask yourself why are you needing to escape? What can you do to change what is your situation? You know, what aren't you doing? Is even the other question I have to ask people. And just remember, if you maintain a healthy perspective and, and come from a, a loving perspective, not anger towards everyone, including yourself, um, you can change the world because the world is like a big pond. Throw in a pebble, the ripples go out, but they always return to the center. That's, that's what I have to say. That was a conversation, wasn't it? I'm really thankful that Hunchy Dukes was willing to go where I wanted to go. And we were able to have what I honestly thought was a very respectful conversation. Even though we, we went out on some of the fringe stuff and we talked a little bit about some of the controversial stuff, I'm appreciative that that wasn't the thrust of the conversation. I think anytime you have a figure who becomes controversial, a lot of us try to reduce that person to the controversy. Any of us is more than that we all have a lot of things in common. And I, I will take this back to a statement I've made on the show many times. No matter who you are and what you train, we all have more in common as martial artists than we do that separates us. We have more alike than in division. You could say it in a number of different ways. So thank you, Hunchy Dukes, for coming on the show and for having such a fun conversation. I really, really enjoyed this. Now, remember, we've got a website for this episode. Transcript may not be up day of, but it gets there eventually, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you're down to support us and the work that we do, remember, you got tons of stuff you can do. You could follow us on social media. You could leave a review. You could pick up something at whistlekick.com with the code podcast15. And of course, we have our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. The whole list, whistlekick.com slash family. Interested in having me come out to your school for a seminar? We can do that. Just reach out. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you've got guest suggestions or other feedback, as long as it's respectful, I'm game to hear it. Let me know. Email me. That's it. Thanks for coming by. I'll see you next time. Until then, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>